Should I do that? Sure. I'm going to keep myself up here. Aloha to those entering the meeting. We're going to get started here in just a moment. We have your mics muted, but we will be using the Q&A feature to take your questions for our guests. So get ready to jot down those as we move through the presentation and make sure to include at least your first name. And, and uh, we have uh, just one guest today, so uh, that's going to be easy who you want to address your question to. Uh, also, we're recording today's presentation uh, for HYA Media Radio Station, YouTube, and you, you'll also be able to find it on MauiReefs.org. So we will get started in just a moment. I see that uh, we are live now on Facebook. And we just want to remind uh, the, the folks on Facebook, too, um, we are using the Q&A feature in Zoom. But if you have questions for our guests when we get started today, you can uh, put that in the, the chat on Facebook. And uh, we have a fabulous person that's going to re relay those questions to us. So go ahead and jot your questions down. Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So if you are here to learn more about sewage impacts on Hawaii's coastal waters, you're in the right place. This is Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's Know Your Ocean virtual monthly speaker series. I'm Darla Palmer Ellingson from Island Environment 360, your host for today's presentation with special guest, Dr. Daniel Amato. But first, uh, Mahalo Maui Nui Marine Resource Council for coordinating this presentation. MNMRC is a nonprofit organization working for healthy coral reefs, clean ocean water, and abundant native fish for the islands of Maui Nui. We have Anne and Meredith from MNMRC in the background uh, running the show. Um, also, mahalo to the County of Maui Office of Economic Development for supporting the Know Your Ocean speaker series. Um, so we are going to be uh, discussing the current situation with uh, sewage pollution in Hawaii, uh, including recent legal decisions, community efforts, and new technological developments in sewage detection that show promise for the future. And I want to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Amato. Um, hello, Daniel. Hello. Okay. You you go by Daniel or you prefer Dr. Dan or <laughs> you can call me whatever. It's okay with me. Okay, great. So Daniel, for those of us that have been following these these uh, sewage and injection well uh, issues so closely, um, sewage treatment and waste flowing into the ocean has been a growing issue for quite some time. Can you give us some historical perspective? Sure. Yeah, I, I touch on this in my presentation. Would you like me to just kind yeah, of yeah? Let's intro? let's jump on in. Okay. Great. Great. All right. I will uh, jump in here, share my screen and my presentation. All right. Okay. I think we're ready. Can you all uh, see my screen? We can. Okay. Awesome. Well, uh, just again, thank you um, to the Maui Nui Marine Resource Council and all of you for signing in today. It's been a great pleasure um, to be able to talk and do such a kind of thorough uh, talk here on kind of the past, present, and the future of sewage. 
Uh, and so I want to start by just introducing my talk. Uh, today I'm going to touch on kind of a brief historical look at sewage impacts in Hawaii, talk about some land-based sewage sources in Hawaii that we've been looking into, discuss some Clean Water Act legislation and relative um, uh, litigation, uh, discuss the recent and current studies of a kind of more academic nature before I close with some future considerations and, and issues and uh, yeah. some solutions. So Daniel, uh, can I interrupt you really quick? I, sure. I apologize so much. I totally forgot to tell people about your wonderful background. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> if I could interject that just to give us a little bit of, of context here. Um, sure. uh, your professional work focuses on the detection and impacts of land-based pollution in the Pacific Ocean and the development of new technology to assist in detecting the DNA of fecal indicator bacteria in the water. Uh, and you're, you're a marine resource specialist at the University of Hawaii at, at Manoa, an environmental scientist at Element Environmental LLC, and you serve as the coordinator for Surfrider Oahu's Blue Water Task Force. I so apologize for, for skipping over that, but I think it was important for people to know your incredible background. So please, please do continue. Okay, well, thanks, Darla. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, to answer your question uh, about the historical impacts, I think there's really no better way to um, bring up sewage in uh, the tropical environment and especially Hawaii without talking about Kaneohe Bay as you know, what I would consider a, a global scale textbook case of how to pollute a beautiful uh, coral bay. Uh, Kaneohe Bay was historically lush coral gardens. There were some uh, septic tanks and cesspools there, but the population wasn't that great. Um, it was still pretty dense, but it wasn't a huge issue until about 1952 when um, the city and county started uh, doing a direct discharge of raw and secondary treated sewage into the bay. By 1972, there was about 3 million gallons of wastewater going into the southeast section of the bay. And my um, you know, academic advisors and uh, colleagues were around uh, in Hawaii then to document it. And what they saw was astonishing. They saw heavily altered uh, ecosystem structure, severe impacts on corals, and this has included uh, eutrophication, decreased species diversity, decreased plankton populations, uh, rapid increases in phytoplankton and algal growth, uh, mainly due to the increased nutrients from the wastewater, decreased water clarity, and with that light penetration into the, into the depths of the reef, um, and increased dominance of filter feeding organisms and detritus eating organisms. These are sponges, these are uh, clams, bivalves, et cetera. And, and most noticeably, uh, a, a overgrowth of invasive algae, Dictyosphera cavernosa, the bubble algae, and um, then uh, also Eucuma, also shown uh, here on my slide, um, really dominating the reef. Uh, activist groups got together. There was a lot of local pressure to cut off the sewage source. So by 78, there was a sewage diversion and uh, showing like the resilience of reefs in general. Once you cut off that nutrient source, that sewage, the, the reefs have the capacity to rapidly recover. And they saw that here in Kaneohe with uh, more than double in coral cover within uh, about a decade. And, um, and yeah, things, that, things are gotten, you know, um, better when the sewage was cut off. And, and how is the bay doing today? I, I remember reading about this so many years ago. Yeah, How's the bay, it doing today? I've spent a fair amount of time snorkeling and doing some research out there, and it is much improved. The algae situation uh, has been very closely managed since there's actually a campaign called the Super Sucker, which literally vacuumed algae off the reef by hand. The state's been um, cultivating uh, native collector urchins by the thousands and dropping them onto these patch reefs where they act as like little um, uh, lawn mowers of the reef eating the bits of seaweed in between the coral fingers that humans can't get to. So it's a highly managed at this point, it's doing a lot better. Uh, but there's still, you know, there's still a sewage issue. We, we have nearly double the population that we did back in the late 70s. And if you look at density maps of cesspools and, and other waste systems in Kaneohe, it's a, it lights up. There's a high density, there's a large sewage impact still. And so that, you know, 
tells us that uh, we are still treating our islands like large toilets. And interestingly enough, hydrologically, these islands act like toilets. So if you can think about the island, the aquifer, those coastal groundwaters, like big toilet bowls that we are polluting with wastewater and other industrial waters, uh, when, the, when the tide drops, when the tide goes out, it's like the flush button, that water flows into uh, the coastal environment right out at the beach in the shallow waters. And, uh, and that's because the, the tide is like the pressure holding that uh, groundwater in the island. And once that tide's released, that sea level goes down, the groundwater can flow out. As the tide comes back in, it pushes fairly, fairly clean ocean water back up under the beaches and into the sand. And, uh, and then the cycle repeats itself. And so the take home message here really is that our land is intimately connected to the ocean. There's no boundary. This, the beach is not a boundary that keeps these, um, these water masses separate. They're intimately connected. They're constantly, twice a day at times, flowing back and forth uh, between the ocean and under the beaches. And so it's just really important to realize that what we do on the land definitely has an impact on the ocean. Fast forward to today, and uh, we are aware of greater than 88,000 cesspools, greater than 110,000 uh, wastewater systems on land, uh, over 100 private injection wells. And as uh, those of you that live on Maui or have been following the Maui um, injection well litigation, uh, there are large municipal injection wells that are, you know, city and county run, um, where they, uh, you know, have millions of gallons of wastewater a day going right into the coastline, uh, generally right near the beach. Oh. And uh, so uh, discussing a little bit of the history of, of the legislature and, and litigation, in 2000, the EPA prohibits construction of uh, new large capacity cesspools. Now these are cesspools that service uh, multiple uh, housing units by 2005, they prohibit the operation of, of any existing ones and about more than uh, three and a half thousand large capacity cesspools are closed. But it wasn't until about 2017 that the legislature really kind of um, passed some meaningful legislation and uh, flat out banned all new cesspool development. And this is really significant because Hawaii, to my knowledge, was the last state to do this, about 50 years behind the last state before that. So we're, as usual, kind of behind the times in, in uh, doing this. Um, and more importantly, they also banned all existing cesspools at kind of uh, at the date of 2050. So by 2050, all existing cesspools need to be upgraded to a higher level of treatment. And so that's a huge problem. We, um, we're really not sure how it's going to happen and who's going to pay for it. And so some of the work that I'm doing is helping to figure that out. I want to also mention that um, in 2015 and 2017, a tax credit was made available for residents to be proactive and upgrade their cesspools. But due to a lack of um, you know, education, outreach, and knowledge about this, really wasn't used. I think I heard maybe somewhere in the 20s, people, you know, 20 or so uh, houses took advantage of this. It wasn't highly utilized. Um, is that not still active, that tax, tax credit? I believe it is active. That's a good question. Okay. I, believe it, I believe it still is. I, we'd have to look a little closer at that, though. Okay. Um, so Act 125 did uh, you know, some important things. They uh, directed the DOH to look into this issue and figure out how to actually go about upgrading all you know, 88,000 cesspools in the state. So they, um, they directed the DOH to evaluate cesspools that already exist and come up with a prioritization scheme for how to tackle these. And so about a year later, there was a report to the ledge that identified 14 areas of the state that with the greatest need for action under four priority categories. Priority one, the highest priority being um, places that present a risk to human impacts, uh, drinking water impacts, or uh, sensitive waters. Priority two was impacts of drinking water. Priority three, sensitive waters and priority four is more of a placeholder for kind of more research, you know, areas that would be identified with further research. Um, and so it's this priority four, which led the, the ledge to pass Act 132 in 2018, where they established a cesspool working group. Now this is a group of professionals that come together and try to figure out how to pull this off and how to pay for it. 
And also they've set aside money to commission a statewide study of seas contamination, which I'm currently crunching the data on and uh, working on a draft to allege for that report. Um, notably, the highest priority for action located on upcountry Maui, uh, where there is a, a really high density of cesspools and known impacts to uh, drinking water production wells there. And also uh, in Kahalu on Oahu, where I personally um, run uh, water samples from every two weeks and can say without a doubt that is, there's a lot of bacteria at the water spilling in the ocean in Kahalu. So very impacted area there. Hey, but, Daniel, I, I just wanted to interject. We got yeah. a, a comment in the Q&A from Stuart Coleman that says the $10,000 tax credit is still active until December 2020. So that's good news. Okay, I mean, great. for now. Thank you, Stuart. Appreciate it. <laughs> right. Okay, uh, with all this talk about cesspools, I can't help but, but coming back to uh, what about injection wells? I mean, these things are basically large cesspools with slightly better treatment, if, if anything. Uh, and so there's been a lot of research in uh, my research community around cesspools, particularly on Maui, focused in Lahaina. And um, after about 10 years of research by my colleagues, Earth Justice felt they had enough data to go to the courts and uh, with you know, backing tw four different Maui groups, the Wa Hawaii Wildlife Fund, the Sierra Club of Maui, Surfrider Foundation, and the West Maui Preservation Association sued the county of Maui for a, a, a basically violating the Clean Water Act by, put, by putting wastewater into their injection wells and with the idea that, it, that water was, uh, was eventually getting into the ocean and polluting the ocean. And so that would be a violation of the Clean Water Act if you are polluting the ocean. Uh, navigable waters is the technical term. Um, they had success in 2014, 2018, where two lower courts ruled in favor of Earth Justice. And uh, in 2020, the Supreme, they went to the Supreme Court in 2019, and in 2020, they finally gave their, um, their decision, which ruled in favor of Earth Justice 6-3, basically saying that wherever, uh, and so Justice Stephen Breyer writes, where uh, the, the, a permit is required to pollute the ocean wherever there's a direct discharge from a point source or um, where there's a functional equivalent of direct discharge. And that's really where this case has come to that, um, that this, you know, this, if you put the wastewater in the ground and then it goes to the ocean, there, that's the functional equivalent. And you know, I, I listened to a lot of this case and I, there's some pretty hilarious, it's not that hilarious, but there's pretty hilarious um, talk from these justices when they're asking questions such as, Okay, so if I take the vodka and I pour the vodka into a glass and then I pour the glass into the punch bowl, am I, am I spiking the punch? Yes or no? They're asking the lawyers this. And, you know, obviously the answer is, yeah, you're spiking the punch. Also, if I have a wastewater pipe and I put the pipe right next to the stream, but I stop about, you know, three feet from the stream, knowing that the water is going to flow in the stream, but it's not flowing directly in the stream, is that polluting the stream? And the answer is, well, yeah, it's polluting the stream. So, it, you know, similar sense, if you put the water in the ground and the groundwater flows to the ocean, then you're polluting the ocean. And that's really kind of the crux of this whole case. So uh, basically, I want to say that SGD or submarine groundwater discharge is, uh, is basically the functional equivalent to direct discharge. And it's a pollutant transport pathway in Hawaii. And so the problem is wastewater has high loads of nutrients, high nitrogen. And if you put this nitrogen into groundwater and that groundwater is flowing into the ocean, you're increasing the nitrogen in the ocean many, many times over. Ocean generally has very little nitrogen. These reefs have evolved on very little nitrogen. So any addition is like adding, you know, fertilizer to your lawn. It's gonna explode and grow. And that's what we're seeing on these reefs. And so our major issue and one that I've really focused on is how this nitrogen addition is really changing reef communities and impacting the health of reefs. Uh, we've seen it lead uh, worldwide to algal blooms, uh, algal blooms of invasive species. Uh, these uh, changes in kind of community dynamics and you know, the algae that's, that's there on the reef to eat can change the fish diversity because fish don't want to eat all the junk algae that came over from you know, Palau or, or some other place that they're not used to 
this type of seaweed. So they're just not going to eat it. They're not going to be there. There's going to be no more of these type of fish around. Uh, nutrients can change microbial communities, uh, and that has been shown to change, um, you know, the fish and the ecosystem structure. And it also can be linked to coral disease. Nutrients control algal growth, as, as I've been saying, and uh, these algal blooms can compete with native species. They can also impact corals through like direct abrasion, the algae literally hitting the corals. And it's even been shown that when algae are just, uh, certain species of algae here in Hawaii are just in the same area as corals, it can negatively impact uh, the health of those corals. There's also been some evidence that um, algae with lots of nitrogen stored in the tissues and with certain amino acids that are then produced in those tissues in bulk are associated with turtle tumors. And for those of you that live on Maui or other areas in Hawaii, you may have seen um, turtles with massive tumors around their neck and eyes, and it can be fatal. It's really gross looking, really sad. Luckily, uh, there has been a decrease recently in this. I've noticed it at Ho'okipa um, decreased greatly. If you've ever been over there on the beach, there's always turtles and uh, there's less turtles with tumors these days in my observation. Um, I've also seen large algal blooms um, that were very likely related to the fertilizer from um, sugarcane fields. Uh, Hypnium musiformis is an invasive alga that was kind of plaguing shorelines of Maui for many years. Uh, washing up on the beach here at, uh, at Kuao or Tavares Bay, you know, feet thick. Um, and this, you know, these things cost money to deal with. They, in 2008, there was an oval bloom in China that was large parts, large bays, large parts of the ocean, cost over $100 million. US EPA estimates about $1 billion per year. This costs uh, US tourism. And um, hypnia blooms on Maui have been estimated to cost about $21 million in kind of cleanup costs and lost revenue for tourism, et cetera. And so I've noticed this on Maui. I've photographed it. There's large green um, clumps of seaweed at low tide. There's large red clumps of seaweed at low tide on different beaches. And, and it, really, uh, it really impacts the beaches. You don't want to be sunbathing there. There's flies. It smells. Um, yeah. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's gross for humans, but it's really gross for the reef. It really changes the reef structure. And so um, we can actually use these seaweeds, though, as, as bioassays to kind of find out where this nitrogen is coming from. They're ideal sources of, uh, they're, they're ideal bioindicators of water nitrogen content and source. They integrate all nitrogen sources over time. They're typically attached to a surface, they're seaweed. Uh, they're easy to collect, they're easy to culture, and typically have low analytical costs. But more importantly, these algae tissues reflect the nitrogen content of the water. So uh, Megan Daler in 2012 published a study where she added wastewater to jars growing seaweed, and the, the, the more wastewater she added, the more nitrogen those um, seaweed took on. They changed from a uh, a very light green to a very dark green. That's got lots of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a nitrogen rich molecule. So they turn dark green. The same thing happened um, for the uh, isotope signature. This is the delta 15N content. It's a, it's a value I'll be talking about more in this talk. It's basically the ratio of the heavy form of nitrogen 15 to the smaller form, uh, nitrogen 14, the lighter form. And what she found was as she increased the, the wastewater effluent in these beakers growing seaweed that they quickly took on the signature of that wastewater. That was a high delta 15 n uh, value in the seaweed tissues, locked in those tissues that we can measure. So Daniel, uh, if seaweed tissues reflect ocean water quality, can you then determine the source of what, what's polluting uh, using the seaweed? Yeah, so the seaweed can give us a relatively good idea of the source. It's not, a, it's not an end-all be-all definitive um, uh, method, but it does give us a lot of information. And we do this through what we call nitrogen source tracking with stable isotopes. So for instance, if you collected a, a seaweed off the rocks, uh, you dried it, ground it up, sent it into the lab, and you got a value of around, let's say, three for a delta 15N value. It's fairly ambiguous where the nitrogen is coming from in that seaweed tissue. It could be natural so soil N, it could be fertilizer, it could be uh, wastewater, septic waste, uh, cesspool waste, et cetera. It's kind of unclear. It's in that kind of ambiguous zone. But if the value is higher, say above six, seven, 
say it's 13, uh, we're sure that the nitrogen in that tissue came from a denitrified process that's typical of wastewater processes. And if you look uphill and you have a wastewater plant or a high density of cesspools, it's, it's very good indication that the water, the nitrogen in that tissue came from that source, that wastewater source up, up the hill. And when you put these two values together, the percent of nitrogen in the tissue and the delta to the n value of the tissue, it gives you a lot more information. Now, I, I want to remind you that the delta 50 and n value is not an indication of the amount of nitrogen. That's what the percent nitrogen does. So the delta 50 and n value gives you an idea of the source when the percent gives you a, an idea of the amount. And so these two together give you a lot of information. So if you have high nitrogen in the tissue and high delta 50 and n value, very likely you have a high wastewater loading in that water the seaweed's growing in. Uh, oppositely, if you have a low value of delta 15 n, say two or zero, and, a, and a, still a large amount of nitrogen in the tissue, it's more likely uh, coming from fertilizer loading from, let's say, a sugarcane field or something like that. So these two values together can be very informative when you look at them together. Um, Megan Daler used a similar approach in, two, in her 2010 publication where she went and did a very extensive algal collection on the uh, island of Maui. And uh, she found some very interesting things where there were wastewater plants, large injection wells, she found very high delta 15N values. Here at Lahaina, uh, she got a value of around 43. In Kihei, a value of about 18. This is, these are delta 15N values, mind you. Kahului, 22. And over near Waihu, where there's a high density of cesspools, probably the highest density near the coastline on Maui, there is a values around 10. So fairly telling wastewater signals in these algae. Uh, a lot more research was done by uh, Craig Glenn and, uh, and colleagues where they did dye injections, they did temp uh, thermal temperature scans, they did more algal work, um, and basically concluded uh, particularly with the dye test, that there was irrefutable evidence for hydrological connection between the wastewater facility and the ocean. There was a minimum travel time of three months from the wastewater facility injection wells to Kaakili Beach Park, where uh, these very significant springs were found in very shallow water. And an estimate that 64% of the wastewater from that plant, which is around 4 million gallons a day, uh, so 64% of that is, is what, like 2.25 million gallons a day coming out of Kaakili. That's excessive. Um, similar work was done in Kihei, although not to the extent as Lahaina, where um, uh, Chip, Chip Hunt from uh, the USGS did a study where he modeled the wastewater in the Kihei facility and um, also added some algal collections along the coastline. And again, very high values of delta 15N in the seaweed right um, just downslope from the facility at the coast, uh, mainly high values in the Kalama Park area and Cove Park area. And if you've ever been to these large, really nice beach parks, they're heavily used. There's Keiki surfing in the water, uh, learning how to surf at Cove Park. And, um, and uh, it's, it's really concerning the amount of wastewater coming out there. Personally, I was there at low tide and uh, recorded a video. Now this is water flowing out of the beach at a fairly high velocity, spilling out of the beach, enough to raise the sand and bubble the sand up. Uh, you can see just the amount of water. This is only one location. Uh, I observed this in multiple locations along Kalama Park. If I had to guess that, you know, just from Chip Fletcher's data, that's 60% wastewater effluent coming out right there at the beach. So with a lot of work being done in Kahului, uh, sorry, in Lahaina, and a lot of work kind of done in Kihei, the work that I did for some of my dissertation was uh, investigating the wastewater situation at Kahului Wastewater Reclamation Facility. And uh, this is a facility right on the coast in Kahului. They put about four and a half million gallons of wastewater uh, into injection wells every day, literally a stone's throw from the ocean. You can see, uh, you can see the ocean right from the injection well. Um, it's very close, about 50 meters or so. And so what we found when we tested the water right under the beach coming out of springs and or just the water in the beach sand that we estimated about 25 to 75% of that was wastewater effluent from the plant um, with high delta 15N values of that water. Um, 
I collected algae all along the coast, and I also deployed it in cages off the coast to kind of find that the extent of the plume of the impact zone of the wastewater from this plant. And uh, generally what I found was it had a measurable impact, what I call a definite wastewater signal about 200 to 300 meters offshore and about a kilometer along the shore. And uh, yeah, impacting a lot of that bay. Is there much reef in that area? Is it also affecting reef in Kahului Bay? Well, yeah, I did benthic surveys at many sites on, uh, on Maui. And uh, what I found in Kahului was really astonishing. I haven't seen anything like it before. They're uh, right offshore of the bay in about, you know, six, seven feet of water um, where you may expect there to be reef. There was this thick fleshy mat that extended as far as I could see of fleshy zoanthids. Now these are coral-like organisms without the coral shell. They're photosynthesizing filter feeders um, that some, some species can be toxic if you mess with them as well. I want to keep that in mind, but I've never seen anything like this. This is totally uh, unique. It hasn't been documented anywhere else I've seen where there's nearly 100% cover of zoanthids. So kind of eerie, creepy, wacky site um, that uh, I think calls for further investigation. But um, yeah, pretty wild. I, we, like I said, we did research at other Maui sites for this study. This is from our 2016 paper in PLOS One where we compared high nitrogen loading locations with low nitrogen loading locations. And generally, we had um, the, the reefs were very different. We had a large amount of macroalgae at, uh, at these high nitrogen loading locations uh, and low coral cover and vice versa at the low nitrogen loading locations. At the high loading locations, the algae that we were deploying and collecting had um, very high nitrogen compared to the low known locations. There's about three times as much nitrogen in the tissues at these high end locations. Have, but, have, um, you, looked, have yeah. you looked into the Oluwalu area? I know that's a kind of an area of debate right now because of a proposed housing development. Um, Mike Fogarty uh, through the chat was, was asking about that. You know, the level of threat in the Oluwalu area. Yeah, personally, I have not done a whole lot of research in the Oluwalu area. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have a lot of information about that. We could look back at Megan Daler's 2010 paper for some uh, potential information or our statewide, uh, Act 132 study, which I'll touch on, uh, later in this talk. But yeah, sorry, I don't have a whole lot of info. Thank you. But some of the best information that we have right now is coming from, uh, these kind of statewide GIS, uh, databases of cesspool um, density across the islands. So uh, in 2009, Bob Whittier and Ali al uh from UH, or Bob Whittier is from the Department of Health now, but they, re they uh, released a GIS kind of density-based map of uh, Wahoo showing where the cesspools were. And it really highlighted these areas that are have some really high densities of, of cesspools. So what I wanted to do for some of my work was collect algae in these places and see if the algae were telling the same story. And um, so I did that around the island of, of uh, Oahu, focusing on three different species and found that in fact, yes, the algae were telling the same exact story as the modeling, reinforcing that the model is potentially really our best kind of statewide um, resource for information as to where we might have wastewater impacts in the state. Um, I did some kind of work in Waimanalo Bay as kind of a case study, looking at the injection well there and the cesspools along the coastline that are very high density in an area called the beach lots, as we call them here on Oahu. Uh, and comparatively, I interestingly found that uh, while both of those, you know, the 754 uh, wastewater units versus the treatment plant, they had generally the same amount of wastewater, 200 million gallons per year going into uh, the bay there, but the, since the wastewater plant was a treatment facility, a secondary treatment facility, it produced only a fraction of the nitrogen and uh, the phosphorus. So again, going back to the models as really being our databases, our, our, our actual known locations of wastewater systems being some of our best information. Again, Bob Woody and Ali al published in 2014, um, wastewater maps for, uh, for some more of the main Hawaiian islands. And they also did some uh, investigation into 
the, this near shore risk severity score, um, identifying coastlines that are most at risk to these uh, wastewater sources. So they did uh, maps for Big Island, for Kauai, for Maui, and for Molokai. And so the, uh, this Act 132 wastewater survey that I've been referring to is a statewide approach um, that, uh, you know, where we were able to get money from the legislature to do this work to help them prioritize areas for upgrades. We're building on this type of work where Bob uh, Whittier is uh, doing the, you know, revising his groundwater models and we're testing uh, algae and water in these areas uh, to determine what areas in Hawaii are most impacted by wastewater. So I'm able to sh share some of the preliminary results with you today. Where again, we're still, the, the numbers are still coming in from the lab. Uh, we're starting to write up um, our results, but briefly I'll share with you that um, we, uh, we have refined our statewide coastal wastewater nitrogen flux mapping and models to the ocean. Now this includes um, cesspools and septic tanks and injection wells. Uh, we collected over 350 seaweed samples of which about a third show evidence of wastewater nitrogen in those tissues and about uh, over 200 water samples were largely still waiting on the results of those. Um, for Maui, um, Michael Mezzacapo recently published some of our kind of uh, preliminary results in his uh, white paper called Identifying Potential Knowledge Gaps for Hawaii's Cessable Conversion Plan. Now, this is largely a white paper to the Cessable Conversion Committee and the legislature to tell them where we really have knowledge gaps in, um, in this and what we need to, you know, figure out before we can really come up with a solid plan to upgrade all these cesspools. And what we're showing here is that two sites comparatively, Waialea, which is just down gradient from a high density of cesspools, came up with um, algae that were collected offshore that uh, had relatively high delta 15N values, relatively high levels of nitrogen in those algal tissues compared to a control site um, in South uh, Kihei where delta 15N values were much lower and about half the nitrogen in those tissues. So really, uh, this brings us to, you know, why are we why are we doing this? What, what's the what's the big deal? Do we need to save reefs? What what do they give us, and what's the value? Um, I'll remind you that reefs provide us with medicine. They provide us with biodiversity, coastal protection, uh, obviously tourism. That's an obvious one here in the islands, uh, and food production. And uh, Nature Conservancy estimates that they're worth nine point nine billion uh, trillion dollars worldwide. Hawaii's reefs, uh, the 410,000 acres, have been estimated at $10 billion. Reefs provide $360 million in net benefits to Hawaii's economy and $835 million in protection to buildings on Oahu, Maui, Kauai, and Hawaii. So these are all kind of values that have been given to our reefs here. Uh, but really, the elephant in the room, in my mind, and I can't stop from always you know, bringing this back into the discussion is what about sea level rise? We're so coastal oriented um, that it's really concerning. A lot of these cesspools are in these low lying areas where the depth to groundwater is feet, like not sufficient for even proper treatment. And so what does one meter of sea level rise do to these? They get, will they be totally flooded? So Chip Fletcher at, uh, at UH and his lab have been looking into this question for, for some time now. And they did a study where they modeled uh, Honolulu area and found that with one meter of sea rise, 23% of their of Honolulu uh, would have groundwater inundation. And this would threaten $5 billion in taxable real estate and about 48 kilometers of roadway. Uh, and of the 259 cesspools in that study area, 86% of them would either be partially uh, inundated or fully flooded at the surface. And then how would that affect the coastal water quality when those flood? Well, you can imagine if these, if these systems are like not functioning very well as it is because the depth of groundwater is so minimal and all of a sudden they're just flooded and that water is, is then just hang out there. It's moving uh, back into, you know, streams and waterways and, and out as quick as, as quick as it can you have high mobility of the pollutants that should be getting treated in these systems. Um, so you have, you know, 
nitrogen going out in the reefs, as I've been talking about, but you also have antibiotics, you have uh, birth control, you have um, other medicines and, and industrial pollutants and chemicals. And, uh, and, and I think one thing that we really don't focus on enough, and one of the large gaps that exists in, in all of this work, is how do these systems impact um, you know, uh, bacteria and, and viral loads in the coastline. Viral load is something we've been talking a lot about lately. And, uh, you know, how, do the, how, how does this impact bacteria in the, in the coastline? I really feel that um, this is, you know, something that needs to be looked at. There's really little data on this and something that I'm, um, you know, currently pursuing ways of, of getting better data at. Would so, that also uh, include health impacts? We've gotten a couple of questions um, from participants that are asking, I mean, you know, we understand we've got this huge issue and we've got some really bad areas of water quality. And when somebody goes swimming in that water, how does that affect their health? Are there studies being done on the, the type of um, nutrients that are in there now and what the potential health hazards are? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's, I think that there are, is a huge lack of information available on, uh, particularly in the tropics, on swimmers' risk and, uh, and bacteria. I mean, you can take the, the data that Surfrider collects and the state of Hawaii collects on enterococcus levels, uh, fecal indicator bacteria, and that has a value you can, you know, depending on the value that you get from your sample, you can, um, you can say that, okay, well, that is, you know, 1% of swimmers will have some sort of swimming related illness at this value, this threshold. And so you can't equate it to swimmers risk and different potential of swimmers risk. But in terms of like actual studies and epidemiological studies of people in Hawaii going swimming, getting sick, uh, there's a huge lack. I mean, there's just not a lot of data sharing. Doctors aren't required to, um, to determine the source of of an uh, infection that they get or an ear infection or a gastrointestinal illness in people they see, they're not required to, um, to give that data to the state. So there's not a database that's being created and there's really little uh, information on this, something that's definitely lacking and could be improved on. Um, but just, you know, even just detecting bacteria in the coastal waters is, is, is difficult. It takes it, you know, it takes a lot of time, money, and effort, and manpower for the state to go around and test, you know, do the, the small amount of testing that they're able to do with their budgets and their staff. And that's why community organizations like, um, like uh, Surfrider and, uh, and other community groups on Maui. Have, Maui Nui uh, Marine Resource Council. <laughs> yep, 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 you yeah. guys are, are joining the cause and, and uh, you know, taking, this, taking these water samples and running them from Enterococcus, which for our listeners is a fecal indicator bacteria. It's not particularly pathogenic, but it does indicate that uh, wastewater is present um, at uh, certain quantities. And so the big issue with these types of tests is that there's it's a 24 hour incubation, which means there's sometimes two day lag between when you take the sample and when data is made public. And so it's really hard to do anything with that. If you were in the water two days ago and you were exposed, you know, it's, it's difficult to to avoid that now that you uh, have already gotten out of the water and, and maybe you got sick, but you're better. It's, so what we're trying to do at UH with, uh, with a collaboration between Surfrider and a private company, Diagenetics, is create an on-site DNA level detection device uh, or protocol that, that will give us results in you know, 30 minutes that is like a, a high quality level uh, of detection. And so it's basically, we're taking this handheld unit called the BioRanger, um, taking water samples and uh, filtering the water samples and running them in the BioRanger, and we can get DNA level quantification of bacteria in uh, under an hour. And so the vision really is for every lifeguard in the state, in the country, in the world, to be able to test the water at their beach um, with using a simple protocol at least once a day or something like this, to be able to do this DNA level science on a park bench. That's kind of where we're, we're trying to push this science. Some people will call it the holy grail of water quality. Um, and yeah, there, it's, it's, uh, it's a great project. I'm happy to announce we just secured, uh, we just started the project in its preliminary state and secured another three years of funding or so to see it through. But we're trying to uh, compare it to our current culture method, which the DOH uses. Um, 
and uh, other you know nonprofits around the country um, submit this method for EPA approval and then ultimately use it to gain more information about how wastewater systems impact bacteria levels at the coastline. So um, that's, uh, you know, stay tuned for more information on that and some preliminary results, hopefully by the middle of next year. Um, and I think that is all I have today. Hopefully I didn't blab on too long and lose your interest. Um, but I'd like to thank uh, the Maui New Marine Resource Council, uh, UH, my co-authors and field and lab assistants, the Surfrider Foundation and the state of Hawaii for uh, making all of this possible. So uh, thank you all. And at this point, I'd love to take any questions. I can't see from my end uh, the questions, so I'll have to rely on you to um, you, hand them over. Yeah, you, you know, there actually was a really good question that came in from Kelly Lundgren. She asks, would septic tanks replacing cesspools in low-lying areas even be a solution? I mean, we know, you know, if a if a septic tank floods, it can be just as toxic. Yes, definitely. So that is a huge issue. I mean, um, ses uh, just simple replacement of uh, these systems with, you know, systems that are going to be equally as uh, vulnerable to sea level rise is obviously not a solution. Now, some people have talked about, well, if you just build a mound and then put it on top of the mound, it'll be a couple feet higher. I don't think that's really a solution either. I mean, in reality, the solution is getting rid of the wastewater, not producing it at all. So I right. think a lot of technology is moving in that direction, being waste, you know, having uh, wastewater facilities that don't produce wastewater. And I actually uh, have uh, stashed away my slides here, a, um, just an example of, how, of where this tech is going, because there's a lot of money going into it right now. The Gates Foundation recently in the last year or two invested $7 million in you know, next generation incinerating toilets. There's other companies um, doing this. Um, uh, Stuart Coleman, who we had just talked about, uh, who just started Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations, or VI, um, is also working to bring this technology to Hawaii, working with a Cinderella company on these incineration toilets. And I'm um, pleased to announce they just installed a, kind of a pr pilot project one out at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, or HINB, on Coconut Island, that research facility that was Gilligan's Island. Uh, and that's a picture of it um, that I'm showing here on my slide of it recently installed. So I think that's really the future, is not creating wastewater. Um, that's really the, the solution from what I can see. You know, I, I mean, we've had the technology to treat our poop for a long time and and putting it together in a device like uh, this high-tech toilet is is kind of the beginning step of, of a very healthy solution. Um, we did have a couple more questions as well. Uh, Andrew Fox asks, would a positive rapid test for en enterococcus result in the beach being closed to use? So I, I think we were talking about, you know, having uh, testing being done more widely and, and so forth. Um, how, how close are we to having that type of test be a rapid test? Well, it's difficult because um, rapid tests sometimes will give you a, a detection or non-detection. And it's really, uh, there's always, you know, generally, more than not, a, a detectable level of fecal indicator bacteria in, in the ocean. Now, the question is how much of it is there? Because that really defines your risk for getting some sort of swimmers-related swimmers illness. So right. um, until, if we could maybe fine tune these rapid detections to be over the threshold for, you know, that DOH uses to close a beach or notify the public, that could potentially be useful. But mm -hmm. in, in order to get um, the, you know, that kind of, quantification level science, it, it usually takes, um, you know, some, some deeper technology. Sure. I, we should remind folks that they can be on an alert list for water quality. I'm on the list. <laughs> so that will alert you if uh, there are some beaches that you want to avoid. And they're, they're, they're usually a science, not, not always uh, up at the beaches as well. Um, so, we had a kind of an, an anonymous question. 
how can we help collect samples properly and otherwise contribute man slash woman powder, power? Oh, I guess that, that comes from Phil. Um, and before you answer, I need to give another plug for Maui Nui Marine Resource Council because they do massive water quality testing if you're listening in from Maui and they, they do accept volunteers in that program. So um, I think it's good to check with those community groups that are, that are doing that. How about you, Dan, what do you say? Yeah, no, I'd second that. I would say find a community group in your area that is, um, that is doing this kind of sampling because they will already have the, uh, you know, spent the money it takes to kind of get the lab going. And then, uh, and yeah, um, show interest and you'll probably get, you know, get looped in and be asked to sample. Um, so, and if there's not one in your area, uh, start them. I know that, you know, Surfrider Foundation in particular is, um, you know, has chapters in at, at different high schools. There's chapters at colleges. There's chapters, uh, there's two chapters on Big Island that, for instance, you know, you can start a chapter or another nonprofit or, or you know, if you want to do this work, I would say it's not that hard to get started. It takes a little bit of capital to get the supplies, but, um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's accessible to everybody. Sure. And uh, again, if you are listening in from Maui, uh, you can go to huiokawaiola.com. That's H-U-I-O-K-A-W-A-I-O-L-A.com if you want to sign up to volunteer. Hey, maybe that is a great note to to end on. Um, I really wanted to thank you so much for talking to us about this, this problem that doesn't seem to go away, but uh, it's important to hear. So, so thank you, Dan, so much. Appreciate it. So before we wrap up today's presentation, um, I, I don't know if, Meredith, can you nod if we're going to play a video clip or, or not? No, we're not going to play one today. Okay, yeah, that's something to look forward to for, for next time. So I just wanted to thank everyone uh, for joining and participating with us to discuss sewage impacts on Hawaii's coastal waters. Coming up Wednesday, November 4th is another free Zoom webinar offered by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. To receive information on that, please visit MauiReefs.org and sign up for the free Reef and Brief e-newsletter or follow m and on Facebook. Special thanks to our presenter, Dr. Daniel Amato. Mahalo also to the County of Maui Office of Economic Development for supporting Know Your Ocean virtual monthly speaker series. You'll be able to view this webinar on Facebook, Akaku Community Media, listen in on Sunday on Kony 104.7, KROC 97.3, KRYL Country 106.5, and Retro 102.1 on Maui, uh, Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And actually, this one will probably go out statewide as well for, for you people that are listening from outside of Maui. Um, we do encourage you to donate to Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. Um, you, you know, as a reminder, they, they are one of the great organizations that just one of the things they do is massive water quality testing, which is so important. Uh, and when you donate, you can get some cool swag. So there you go. Maui Nui Marine Resource Council works for healthy coral reefs, clean ocean water, and abundant native fish for the islands of Maui County. Learn more at www.mauireefs.org. And that is it for our show today. I just want to say aloha to everyone. Aloha. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Dan. Welcome. Thanks, Pleasure. Dan. Bye.